you post i think it was on instagram a picture of you playing broken sword on and i forgot it was on this platform the game boy advance mm. so bear in mind broken sword point and click adventure cd with talking in it throughout was also on the game boy advance now obviously it was all subtitled and not full speech but that was quite a feat to get on the game boy advance so how how going back years later and trying it now what were your impressions and people complained that it didn't have the voices actually <laughs> that was really funny oh come on how <laughs> realistic was it ever to get voices well yeah maybe I mean, you could get the maybe you could get the first line <laughs> one well that opening probably that opening a uh, decent bit rate that opening sentence of you know paris in the fall uh this, mm. this all, all that stuff that's probably more than eight meg isn't it so <laughs> Uh, I mean, I actually wrote, I wrote about this stuff recently because it's because it's part it's, it's about midway through the book, so um, I have to go back and and and, and dig, dig through my my diaries and stuff and think about how we did it. And I, I looked at the source code and stuff as well, so I, I, so it's all quite fresh in my mind now. I mean, it, it was Bam's idea; they were the publisher, and um, uh, you know, we had a big argument about what cartridge size we could use because I think most of them were two or four meg carts for the gb8 and they got they, they, they kind of went up in powers of two so it was like 248 in theory you could get a 16 or a 32 meg cart for it as well but i think virtually not no game ever used 16 or 32 because the, the duplication costs were too expensive so we, we had a big fight just to get it onto eight meg because they, they were telling us four but then it was never going to do that um we we did get it into we did get it into eight with uh, uh, as i often talk about yeah, eight bytes to spare on that cartridge um but you know we we did it by basically it was a it was a whole fresh implementation it wasn't a case of porting the old game it was a it was a new engine and we we basically um we spread if you imagine we spread the old game across the floor every single individual component part of it and and picked up the key ones that had to go into the new game on the gba and and left the ones that weren't absolutely vital and and as we went along we we, we projected forward to see what we thought the memory usage was going to be if it carried on at this rate so that when we got to the end of the game having picked up the bits of the old game off the floor and put them into the new one we we got it just exactly right um and we, you know we, we had to we had to compress more uh, you know the, the 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 backgrounds are JPEGs, and we kept having to cut them more and compress them harder, and to to bring it back down into into fitting onto the cartridge and stuff. And and obviously we we didn't, you know, all, all, all of the sort of the thing about like Broken Sword is it's 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 got extra stuff in it. It's got you know you got the main line through the game, but if you start talking to someone about the crowbar or something like that you know the sewer key that that or try and use it on something else or give it to someone else you, you'll get a response you, you always get a response in broken sword and obviously people love that so we you know those kind of things fell by the wayside so the, the gba version is more it's more the pure path through it that you that you get and the things to the side of it had had to had to fall by the wayside and obviously the history of broken sword director's cut is that it came from the gba version because there, there was at that point there was no way to recompile the original game it was effectively a rom um so you know when when, when ubisoft said can you add whole extra bits at the beginning there was, there was no way to do it you know so we built it on the gba version which and and went back to the floor and put more of those things that were left back into it but not, but still not all of them. Because I mean, even the even the the DS director's cut, which was the first iteration of the of the director's cut, it, it too was memory constrained, but but not as much as the GBA. So more more things from the original got put into it, but there were still things missing. But obviously, eventually, this version made it to the PC, and at that point, some of the original players, some of the original players, picked it up and said they've cut things out and you know we hate them for it and that that that's not quite true you know we didn't cut things out we just never got to put them back in so it's slightly different but that's that's the the torturous path of the director's cut but the gba version wow. yeah it was it was it was a fun little challenge certainly but it was done quite quickly 
So how did you manage the music? Because as far as atmosphere, that music score is amazing. And it's, I think Breton Sword 1, it just absolutely nailed it for me. So how on earth did that work on the GBA? That's a good question, actually. How did the music work? I mean, it was redone. It was just, it was the same sort of thing, really. It was, it was, it was recomposed into little, little fragments of tune using, wow, using whatever. I mean, it wasn't the big samples, obviously, from the, from the original. So we just picked yeah, it was up. like the CD stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, and it was all little scores. And then the original's made up of lots and lots, hundreds of tiny, fully, full samples of Barry's orchestra. Um, that he recorded obviously none of those none of the samples could be used in the in the gba so it's just little it's just little midi tunes i suppose it's amazing how these constraints bring new kind of invention I mean, so a lot of the most exciting things is a youtube channel called digital foundry and they do comparisons and I find the ones interesting between ps5 and xbox series x and i think that's more because i know i've got the x series x and i want to know that Okay, it's at least matching the PS5, even if it isn't always going better than the PS5. It just makes me feel a little bit better. But it's it's also interesting how the different systems are working to do the same goal. But what the one that really interests me is when they say, and this is Doom Eternal on the Nintendo Switch, which is going to this really... put. It's almost like a GBA in the sense of, here's Broken Sword on the PC, you're going to get on the GBA. Well, here's Doom Eternal that was really designed for PC platforms and powerful consoles. And then we're going to stick it on this portable Switch device, which is far less powerful, far, far, far less powerful with bandwidth issues and far less memory and stuff like that. And those videos are, okay, graphically, it never looks as good. The frame rate's probably capped to 30 instead of 60. But, you know, what they managed to achieve with what is there is sometimes quite remarkable. And you think, well done, that must have took a lot of effort by developers. As you say, down-resing things and mm. cutting back carefully. Because you can go too far to the game looks absolutely atrocious. It's all that balancing act of, can we still make it look a good representation of the original mm. without compressing the hell out of it? And it's, mm. it's exactly what you've just discussed. And they're doing that sort of thing with the Switch now. I suppose you, if if you're buying if you're buying it on the Switch or whatever or the GBA, I mean, you, you accept that compromise, don't you? Yeah. I mean, in in a way, I mean, although the GBA sword is is obviously a lot less than the PC one, it's just that it's the, the sheer novelty, of the fact that you can be playing it on this tiny little thing that, um, yeah, that 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 is the thrill, I suppose, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, I love the little GBA Definitely. version. I, I think it's I think it's really good. Um, Probably, probably one of my proudest things that I did because because it was basically my mine and Stevens's project. You know, we sat in a little corner and, and did it pretty much ourselves. Well, we had a couple of helpers, but but the main you know we weren't the main team at Revolution doing that game. Um, and of course, the, the the other story about that is that we 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 were within two weeks of finishing Broken Sword Two on GBA, and then uh, the Bam Bam Company they they collapsed, so that game was never paid for so therefore it never it never never finished but it was in last it was in the last two weeks of testing and tidying so it, you know another couple of weeks and we would that that might have gone off to duplication and been been a, a real thing and oh, i've got man. i found it i found the sources uh, you know on that big pile of hard disks so I, i've actually got it all now um but it'll never it'll never see the light of day i'm sure I can't remember what, so is it, what bugs were in it still. I mean, it had a few little things. It was, it wasn't done, you know, but it wasn't far off. You could play it all the way through. Sounds like a great game preservation. That would be something absolutely amazing if it can't be a commercial thing just to have out there one day. Yeah. I mean, if I was like um, retired and idle and had some, had some time, I could, get a GBA dev kit and maybe try and make it run again, you know, and then, and then you'd be in a position to, to release the, the, the binary, you know, but it would take a lot of doing. Take a That's lot your of second thing. Kickstarter then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, a GBA dev kit, that would be, uh, that would be, yeah, that's not going to be a cheap acquisition. It might not be cheap. No. So I think it wouldn't be an easy thing to, um, I mean, it would be great though, wouldn't it? 